It's wrong, misleading. Yeah, it is misleading. <laughs> I'm gonna change the whole animation. I'm gonna put Leroy in last because <laughs> he's always last into the mm -hmm. room. Can I just have his head pop in like? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Oh, yeah, yeah. You always have to say, start the party. Yeah, I can, ooh, we can have that. I could record you saying that, how he pop in, start the party. There you go. Yeah, that'd be good. That seems like a lot more work for me, though. <laughs> what? I just don't have time for it. Don't start nothing. Hey. Won't be nothing. Hey. All right. James Brown, the, hey. fam the famous poet, said, static. Static. We are already suffering. Won't the, be no static. ill-tempered climate of San Diego. With rain yes. and frigid temperatures. Well, absolutely, I know. There was actually so let's, let's frost on the ground. ground. Yeah, there was frost on the ground more than once. I saw somebody's car with snow on it. No, and I just had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? You thought you were back in Philly? No, you know, I thought what? I was back in Virginia for a minute. What? What? I know. It's just the things we suffer. You know, and the thing is, forty-four degrees in California. Say, you know, just, we, people said, "I don't mind paying the sunshine injustice. tax, but I want the sunshine." That's yeah. right. So I think they should pass a law in California that there shouldn't be any more rain. Mm -hmm. well, you know, what, because a lot all we just need to do is support global warming. Mm. Mm. Well, that's mm. another strategy. I'm thinking about going out and buying like a 1970s Buick. Yeah, we only have <laughs> I'm not going to license it to drive. Just going to run. Just it. run it. Just right? run and it like 24 hours a day. Just trying we to make sure. We have 10 more years left anyway. What do we care? Uh, yeah, that's true. That's right. What do we I care? thought it was 12 more years. Oh well, you know. Was it? You have, oh, you have a cap for inflation. Yeah. Oh shoot. Yeah, time inflates. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That's that's 12 years in. Depends Northern on how time. many cows we have around. Mm. <laughs> right. But in leftist Ocasio Cortez time, how many, time, that how, many like how many hamburgers we'll be without? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the more hamburgers we eat, the longer we'll last because it'll be less cows who are that are, you know. So eat more cows is the yes. solution. Mm -hmm. Don't right. don't become vegetarian. The solution is to become vegans are really killing the environment. That's so, what I hear you saying. I think so. it's vegans are involved oh, it's for the global vegan. warming. <laughs> That's right. It yeah. is. Because if they were eating cows, they'd be And, they, and you know, if you're a vegan, you, there's more flatulence anyway because you're full of gas. Hot air. It's okay for people to do that, but not for cows. Mm, well. No, not, not really even that. No, apparently that's... that's, that's apparently. People argue that too many people, that's why. Yes. Oh, well, they're working we, on we, that. We, yeah, we talked about that, you know, uh -huh. on the show before. People wanted to do off with humanity. Off with humanity. Oh, oh man. Ah, well. They never we, begin with themselves, do they? I know, no. Well... You lead the way. You're a good, a good leader leads the way. See, you say that in jest because you think that points out the lunacy of what they say, but then somebody hears that and says, yeah, he's right. I need to be consistent with that. And then people start <laughs> acting on those things. No, they think I'm a cruel human being as a, you know, as a white male. No, it's just talking. stuff that you used to be able to say in jest to point out the yeah. silliness is, is like now it's like leads the news. Right. <laughs> so it's like right. it used to be parody. Now it's headlines. So anyway, we are still working our way through the book on 77 Arguments, or Modern Ethics in 77 Arguments. I always get the title, like, you know. It's, an, it's a unique backwards. title. Yeah. Yeah. Especially since the word arguments modern is, is not even on there. That's modern right. Ethics in 77 Arguments. Nothing. Arguments. Right. It's implied arguments. Yeah. <laughs> it's implied on that pretty hard. 77, whatever. We whatever. Just, we don't, 77. That's, we don't want the book to identify with arguments. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. they're not making any arguments. Seems like a mean word. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. well, and some of them barely qualify as arguments, so maybe they were what? trying to have honesty on the front. <laughs> mm. A moment of honesty. Yikes. Mm. That Owie. was hurtful. This one, this, this week, this one, this week is pretty... Uh, yeah, she read it? Word said you've forgotten, so I was like... <laughs> What is this the only thing you know? <laughs> <laughs> but do, do, what am I missing here? What he it says you if you read it. Did you read it? You asked me like a half an hour ago, what's the chapter? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Did I read it? Did not only did I, not only do I read it, first of all. Remember that bus that Ward just I drove know, over you? you know, oh my goodness. You know, you know Ward, remember, <laughs> it was more than an hour. It was more than an hour ago. I asked you when I was in your office this morning. Yeah, that's what he asked you this morning. You have we'll plenty of time. To <laughs> we'll go with that. You have plenty I wasn't of time even to in your office an hour ago. You better not have been. You need to work. That's All true. right. That's true. So anyway, oh what were you going to say? That's true. That's true. Let me just that's say true. the chapter, like, just so Slave those master. following along. <laughs> oh. 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 That was a joke. Uh, All right. 
So, so normally those things don't get recorded. So, all right. So we're on the section on government, <laughs> argument number thirty-five, which is really chapter thirty-five of this mm-hmm. book. Uh, questions for free market moralists by Amia Svirazum. 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 I'm not going to butcher her name. I'm just going to call her Dr. Amia, by the way. Oh, she's a doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a, she teaches at Oxford. Oh. Mm-hmm. She, uh, was, she was, at the time of the writing, she was just a um, sort of postdoc uh, you know, employee there. But now she's an associate professor uh, at the University of Oxford, and she teaches at uh, St. John's College. Mm-hmm. So yeah. she's an associate professor at Oxford now. So, which may explain some of her uh, not understanding what U.S. law is about, which we'll get to later. Mm-hmm. I'll explain. But anyway, <laughs> but um, yeah, she's writing about the U.S. and doesn't understand it. So anyway, that's one thing. That we'll, we'll get back to that. Anyway, so and that's her chapter, Questions on Free Market Moralists, by Dr. Amira Svinevasum. Sorry, I don't really mean to butcher her name. I just don't have this. I don't know how to say it. I can't. I practiced even earlier, too. Did you? Confess. Yeah. I really was practicing. Right, okay. I'm going to say this right. I'm going to say it. I, I did practice it last week. When I was first reading it. Uh, Srinivasam. Srinivasam. No, because it's, it's like the Srinivasam. I don't no, know. Srina Vasan. That's no, not serious. It's like SR. It says Srina. Srina. Oh, Srina. Srina Vasan. Do, do an SH sound? Srina Vasan. There you go. Srina Vasan. Srina Vasan. Interesting name. I like butcher, it. But I'm going to butcher yeah. it the whole time. I like so it. I'm, I'm so. out of respect calling her Dr. Mia just yes. because I, I know, Vasan. butcher that the entire time. I, I would right. pronounce it with like almost like an SHR. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. I think it's got some Russian in it. I didn't look up her background. No, I think she's I'm Indian. There's some sort of Russian. I thought she was Indian. I think or, she's Indian. Or, oh, is that what it is? Yeah, I think she's Indian. Yeah. Maybe Indian. Oh, maybe about a picture. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that might be it. Anyway. Um, anyway, so we covered issues, but you were going to say that's her chapter. She's a associate professor at Oxford now. Uh, at the writing of this, she wasn't there, but she's moving into that position. So they saw her writing in this as sufficient. To qualify for Oxford standards, so we'll mm-hmm. go with that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so what were you going to say about the chapter in the oh, I, couple of minutes you devoted to reading it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the key thing for us as we talk about it is she never really explains John Rawls' theory. Okay. She so, never explains it. So There's some assumptions I'll grant you in the chapter. Let mm-hmm. me do a quick summary. That before we jump into the details, so we don't lose people exactly what's going on if they have not read it, which you probably hopefully have, because uh, we want people to follow along and ask questions, and we'll we'll post those on here as we get those, and we've done it over a couple weeks, and get to post them and, sh- and chat about that. But uh, here's here's my summary of what you wrote. So, uh, Doctor Am- Amia, <laughs> I didn't say that thing. I put her last name, but Srina Vasan. That's good. That's argues right. that there are two competing political theories governing morality of the U.S. economic system, and really the West, but um, she mentions the U.S. politics in this. So, The first was proposed in 1971 by John Rawls in his book, A Theory of Justice, in which he penned a defense of modern liberalism advocating wealth redistribution. Rawls' ideal moral economics was governed by a blind reason that guaranteed a reasonable standard of living for everybody. The second competing theory is the system of economic justice advocated in 1974 by Robert uh, Nozick in his book uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which argued that unrestricted free markets always produce the moral good. Hmm. Uh, Srinivasan poses four questions which she argues show the irrationality of Nozickian free market theory and demonstrate why society must bend towards Rawls' vision of welfare liberalism. Mm-hmm. Boom. Redistributive justice. Yeah, redistributive yeah, justice. Why, why only those two? I mean, my, my immediate thought... Which is a question, Why yeah. only those two? I mean, are there other forms of, uh, uh, you know... Which, which is a problem in her whole economic thing. Economic system. Sort of it's a, just, it's yeah, a false dilemma it she totally creates. totally is. Bait and switch, false um, dilemma, you know. And, yeah, and we can unpack that too. Sure. But, yeah, she said she says... One is bad, therefore the other must be the right one. Mm-hmm. Is sort of the, set, the, the, the essence of her argument, which you brought up in previous ones, where it's prove this one is flawed and then tell people there's only two choices. Therefore, if that one's flawed, this one, you must disagree with that, you disagree with that one, mm-hmm. therefore you must agree with mine. And that's right. sort of all she does, which the is whole terrible, terrible argumentation. Terrible argumentation. Yeah. But at Oxford, they love that. 
So yeah. it, it it doesn't it doesn't meet the logic test the test of logic that's for sure. Yeah. Although she is a she is an um, articulate writer, and she you know yeah. she she does a good job as far as that goes. I, I uh, actually found her. I actually found like some of her phrasing of the questions simplistic. The the most difficult to manage so far in the whole book. Like mm -hmm. she speaks in double negatives, mm -hmm. and I had mm -hmm. to rewrite her sentences, mm -hmm. her questions, like several times to say wait. And then, you know, take out the negatives, put them right. in a positive. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had to rewrite several of them a couple times to make sure, okay, then reread it. And like, is that what she's really arguing? And because mm -hmm. I, I found it actually. Yeah, I don't like a lot of what she said. But she, she doesn't generally, I mean, she's, she does a pretty good job, but for her position, well, but I, her logic is, is multiply flawed. We're going to get into that. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that was going to be good. Well, so. here's, here's the first quote. I'll, I'll jump in with this one and see what you guys think. Because this one, um, you know, we already talked about Rawls and uh, Nozick represent these two poles of the mainstream, she says, right. in Western political discourse. Welfare liberalism, she says, and laissez-faire liberalism. That's how she describes La it. Respectively. Like laissez-faire. Laissez-faire. I always look at it and say laissez hardly, She said, it's hardly a wide ideological spectrum, but that's the mainstream for, for you. So she's saying, well, it's a pretty narrow difference. There's not even that much difference between the two, but this is all you get for the mainstream. Okay. So on the whole, Western societies are still more Rawlsian than Nozickian. So the more welfare related than laissez-faire related. Uh, they tend to have social welfare systems and redistributive wealth through taxation. But since the 1970s, they have become steadily more Nozickian. Such creeping cha changes are the erosion of the welfare state, the privatization of public sphere, increased protections for corporations along with a moral worldview according to which the free market is the embodiment of justice. The rise of Nozickian thinking coincides with the dramatic increase in economic inequality in the United States over the past five decades. So she's talking about Western civilization, but she's mostly talking about United States. And then she did do some schooling at, uh, I think, what is it, uh, Princeton or something like that. But I don't know what her background is in the United States, but she lives in... It's always irrit an irritant to me when people outside the United States, like, you know, she's talking about U.S. politics or whatever. Yeah. Well, well, it's, it's anyway, she says that what do you think of this summary that she gives? Right. Any issues with well, she, that? Yeah, she, I mean, they tend to have social welfare systems and redistributive wealth through taxation. But our taxation system isn't for redistribu redistributing wealth. Although I think you know some uh, Democrats and progressives are trying to do it because that's it's it as a means to it. But that's not the that's not the point of taxation. The taxation is a means of paying for uh, certain um, uh, things like. The government, in the military. In your view, yeah. Right. But her view. But that's yeah, not, yeah. but, but on, not um. Well, on on one view, that's what they want to use it for. On another view, they don't. I mean, on on the on the, the Rawlian view, that's how they want to do it. But but for the Nozikian view, it's not. Uh, yeah. Right. Taxes isn't for right. they're they're distributing wealth. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I think yeah. it's. It's uh, but it's like that's she not, assumes that, a moral framework that makes right, one wrong, right? Which is exactly, you can't. That's well, not the, what's going on. The so. issue is, I, I, I'm just tripping, tripping on uh, the fact that she's using such a late theories to explain what ought to be, and she doesn't deal with like Locke. You know, she doesn't deal with why do we get together for the in the first place? Why yeah. do we bring up? Why do why do why do free people um, come together? In yeah. the first place, which is to secure, well, well protect exactly. their wealth, and and that's that's a good point because the, this goes to that you know false dichotomy she creates between the two choices. Both these choices, I think, fall within. Now, I'm not overly familiar with either one of their specific books. I'll link to them in the in the post after. Mm. So I confess I'm not. I assume I'm taking for granted she describes these positions fairly. Yeah, yeah. But so she I'm going to critique her actual argument. She doesn't describe Rawls at all. Well, but I know. But I'm saying I'm going to assume her description. Her of description them is, is fair and right, accurate. Right, right. Because even then, I think the argument fails. But I, I would question if it was accurate. You know, I don't okay. have enough expertise so, yeah. to say if it's accurate so. or not. But I, but I would say this: both of those, I think, from her descriptions, though, fall within. A definitely a secular worldview, a natural, a purely naturalistic worldview, that would probably deny any sort of natural law theory. Both no, these totally. theories would deny natural law theory, totally. which you bring up in Locke and, totally. and the previous guys, natural law theory. So, so her two choices both seem to fall within a naturalistic worldview and deny deny nat, you know uh, natural law theory. 
And and so there again, she's not even really going all the choices. She's just saying these are the best choices in her worldview, but not really telling the reader that that's what they are. And that's one thing she doesn't define clearly. It just sort of makes it those choices. She, she does yeah, argue does. that she thinks that if in the first no, on the first question or on the first page, she's arguing that um, if we started with a blank slate, do you guys remember that? Well, let's, before we get to that first question, okay. let's finish yeah, this, yeah, yeah, setting the framework she, for this. She has I want four to go through each of those questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things she said in the quote that you read here, the rise of uh, Musician uh, thinking coincides with a dramatic increase in economic inequality in the United States. Notice that she, she locates the United States here. Not yeah. It's no longer the West. Um, yeah, that's what I thought was odd. Yeah, it well, between she, West and U.S. Right, yeah, the Western, whatever. Um, right. and, and Okay, fine, but first of all, is economic inequality wrong? Well, and well, that's what she argues is yes, I guess. That's, well, that's, uh, that's, that's the implication. Is, well, well, well wait, wait a minute, you know. Um, economic inequality, once again, a lot of what happens, what people do, liberals do in particular, is they'll use generic phrases. Um, to be able to cover over the details of something. So certainly there are some people that are more wealthy. But what she's not addressing, what, what it completely skips over, is the fact that capitalism has taken has taken 40% of the people who lived in poverty in the world, not just in the United States, in the world, and taken them out of poverty yeah. to a very... See, Excellent. and that's the point. She's focusing on the difference between the wealthy and poor, but With not the, the fact that the poor themselves... Was, are fewer comparatively under, and under, are poor under in the United States yeah. and because of the, our capitalistic uh, yeah the type poorest of, of the poor in the US are still in the world's top probably one or five percent of the wealthiest in, in people absolutely and what she Which, does is you know I mean they're in the top I don't know the number yeah. but it's in the top percentage of wealthiest people and even what she does in pitting people, the so. poor against the rich is she ascribes a moral quality to the poor and ascribes some kind of evil um, mm -hmm. um Equal, injustice, evil injustice to the mm -hmm. rich. Right. She soon she it's it's implicit in our, our even if, even if they earned it and right. even if they didn't, it doesn't matter. Right. You have more, therefore it's wrong. Right. Yeah. Where's that come from? That what, what's come, the what's which, the source? Yeah, we'll have. To, I mean, so, we said about this. Yeah. The other thing, the other flaw in this early part that I think is important is she just says uh, such creeping changes are the erosion of the welfare state. So she's talking about the erosion of, as if. She just assumes, like, as if it's always been there. You know, yeah, history right. began the moment right. I wrote this. Right. You know, yeah, and so, right, like, right. it's erosion. But but what, what she doesn't seem to either convey, and maybe she doesn't understand, I don't know her history of the United States, that what she knows or doesn't know, but it doesn't come across on this, is any understanding of the fact that the welfare state, you know, the, the FDR New Deal kind of thing, which we covered in our previous episode, the New Deal is a racist deal. Um, prior to that, the, the work of helping... The, the welfare state was not the welfare state. It was the welfare church. It was the well, it was the nonprofits through the 1800s, the 1900s, the early part of the 20th century that did all the taking care of those people. It was not the role of the state. The state took that from the nonprofit industry, and I teach this to my students when I do the nonprofit stuff because this is really important to understand. Is they took this from the nonprofit industry, and then by regulation, she talks about protections for the corporations. There are protections for the state as the only guarantor of those who can help people. Mm -hmm. Like here in San Diego, we talked about it, uh, I think, in the past, where they make it, if you in El Cajon, California, want to go and feed the homeless, you can get, like, cited or put in jail for that because they don't want you going unless you have a permit to feed. or to keep. So they've made it in very difficult. I used to work for a Safeway up in Washington when I was planting my first church. That was my job. That paid and you know there's all this food they throw away and right. i'm thinking you know you look at this oh how wasteful americans are oh this is so terrible there's what laws you against don't giving. know exactly what you yeah. don't know is that they used to do that all the time mm -hmm. but then one you know somebody sues oh i got sick eating your day old bread and then they said well look we, we you know there's no laws to protect them for giving and it's perfectly good food it's just somebody you know you know angling for money and the lawyers that'll do it just these nuisance lawsuits um, and so it becomes impossible for private corporations or nonprofits or public corporations to take care of those needs. So the government controls that and limits it. She doesn't acknowledge it at all. She goes, oh, it's just the erosion, as if that's the only, as if eroding the welfare state means nothing will ever happen good for people. That's not true. It happened good for people. They were taken care of before the government took mm -hmm. over. All right. That's, so that's not inherently a problem that she doesn't, and she doesn't adjust that. So it's you have a question. Go ahead. 
I'll, I'll check it out. Oh, okay, we do have a question. I'll have to yep. drop it up. I just want to like to preview them first. So there's our question. So our question is, so the, um, what does it say? The poor, the poor are helpless in her eyes question. Um, I would say to try to be as fair as I can to her view, I, helpless might mean a different thing for her. I think she would say that the, the structure of civilization is such that it oppresses these people and forces them into poor decisions that they are helpless to change or make different but that's because the, the systems themselves, the governments and the, and the social structures are themselves corrupt. Right. So it's not that they're helpless, it's that the government keeps them helpless except and the social both. structures it's keep both. themselves. Because she, yeah. does, she does talk about them being, yeah. uh, is it under three here? Oh, the people's capacities to produce goods and services blah, 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 blah. is limited uh, by their gender. By their, by their genetic dispositions, mm -hmm. their parents' education, yeah, the, luck, yeah, well, the amount yeah. of race... And rate, uh, sex based discrimination. And that's that's one of the worst statements of all time there. Right, uh, uh, absolutely. So that's now, one of the worst statements. So now of all time. And I'm going to unpack that when we get more to that question, the right. question so, she's asking, because that's important. The so, problem, yeah. One, so, once again, what she's doing is she's, she's covering all these bases. So, mm -hmm. no matter which direction you go, there is, she set them up for failure. Yes. You have no out, so you must be reliant. The only way for them to get out is if we graciously oh, no. take somebody else's money. And give it to Except you. for the fact that yeah. when you look at so it's both just as so it's both things. The well, government both, right. makes them not responsible, but they too are genetically possibly by the luck of the birth right. also uh, I I incapable of rising above circumstances. And one of the marks so of a position, yeah, one of the marks of a position not being able, not being a good position is if you can't have if you can't refute it. if it, if no evidence goes against it you yeah. don't have actually have a solid position because right. it needs to be able to be you know, what would falsify. what would dis falsify what would disprove it if nothing can disprove it you, you're so generic you you've got nothing there and her position is so generic it, it covers nothing can disprove it nothing, nothing can disprove it uh, except for reality other than reality except exactly. for reality and reality except for us on so off she, the couch. she wants she wants <laughs> she wants them to be treated as equals but they're not equals genetically right. she wants them to be oh yeah they're responsible but they're not responsible she wants them both you can't do that yeah. and that's a full, very very fallacious logically speaking but go ahead sir I was going to say off. except when you look in reality I mean people are moving out of from, you no know, one stays poor in America people move out of poverty and, and, and the they move class. out of the top one percent. And they move in and out of she the top one percent. She assumed those are static categories. And they, and they is, move, yeah. in, and the middle class is shrinking because most of the middle class is moving into right. the top, into the one percent. Right. So, when you look at reality, reality refutes her ideas. That's true, and that, I didn't even make a note of that because there's so much in this chapter. But right. that's I remember thinking that she talks as if these categories social are static categories forever. are static. Yeah. Oh, right. if you're that's born true. rich, you're going to stay rich. That's if you're born poor, you're going to stay poor. Yeah. And there's no chance. Right. It doesn't look at the actual facts. That I think those in the top five or ten percent or something like that. That's more. they cl less that's class. Like several years. You, you I mean, know what? That's that, class oriented. She's looking right. at class like you would have in maybe yeah. in India it's, or it's someplace a Marxist view where you can't get out of it. It yeah. is. And so it is. It's a Marxist it, view that it is. classes are static and forced, and you are not incapable of escaping those things. Right. The the thing that really the thing that really encompasses this. I was driving up the hill. Not and bad I, for 30 minutes before. Stop it. I was, <laughs> I was driving up the hill, and I was thinking, if any of you are interested, there's a short video called Harrison Bergeron. Harrison Bergeron, written by Kurt Vonnegut, totally exemplifies the kind of world that she wants us to move into. Mm. A world where everybody is equal, nobody is special, and everyone has limitations put on them in order so that no one can stand out. It's a great... Short video, and that's watch. what she basically describes. It's in that exactly blind right. Test mm, yeah. It's yeah. exactly yeah. right. So it's yeah. a great video so. to watch. And Harrison Bergeron was written by Kurt Vonnegut, I believe, and I don't, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm almost certain to refute Rawlsian theory. So mm. you should watch it. It's very interesting. We'll have to we'll have to link to that after on the, so people can find that too. Well, let's move. Okay, so that we set the framework for it, and then right. so we already said what she does is she says there's these two choices, as if those are the only two. Right. And she basically sets all of her article about disproving uh, Nozickian sort of philosophy, mm -hmm. the, the free market philosophy, um, as false by, she says there's four questions. Yep. And unless you can answer yes to every, all four, 
you you know you can't you can't accept his view right which right. I'm gonna assume is true and you know that's fine I'm gonna assume that that's if you can't say yes that that eliminates his free market you know philosophy which it may because I don't know that I agree with his free market philosophy at least how she describes well, it I'm fine with not agreeing with it but again I don't think yeah. it's the only alternative to go to her right. direction that's that's another so problem I'm not gonna is the false dilemma fall into yeah. that false so, dilemma false dichotomy but, but yeah. let's look at those four questions and then see what you guys think so right. question number one she says is this. The first question you must agree to if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to buy Nozick's argument is that is any exchange between two people in the absence of direct physical compulsion by one party against the other or the threat thereof necessarily free? If you say yes, then you think that people can never be coerced into action by circumstances that do not involve the direct physical compulsion of another person. That's a that's a that's a the question is framed so poorly. Yeah. She only asks whether it's free. She doesn't ask whether it's right or wrong in the question. Yeah, which I, I did pivot upon at first, and she gets out of question number two. Mm-hmm. For, there, there is yeah. So some that that I thought she kind of conflated a little bit in question right. one, but there's still a little more meat on question one before mm-hmm. we get into the moral. Which she, she tries yeah, to get for her to. for her for the issue of freedom, it only comes through for her on on this account, and I, I can't imagine anyone legitimately agreeing with this from physical compulsion. I say, well, there's yeah. all kinds of ways to manipulate people. Yeah. You can steal them. You can prostitute them. Uh, you know, yeah, that's what she there, talks about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I, we agree with that, but there's, but there's also, um, you know, social prep pressures of manipulation, parent, child, there's bullies, yeah. there's social media now, you know, bullies. Yeah. There, you know, it's, it's, it's all kinds of things. It's like, well, do you want to be loved or not? I'm not going to love you unless you go do this. They use a social or a relational manipulation. It's not just physical. Um, yes. It, and so it's, what, a, it's yeah. a very myopic view and understanding and of, of if, people. If that's if that's a fair if that's what Nozicki Nozick argues in Nozicki right. free market right. economies. Right. If he argues that it's only, only physical, physical, that as long as there's no physical threat. There's no such thing as coercion. Right. Then he's wrong. Okay. Well, then that's absolutely. Dumb. Okay. Well, well, let's agree, all agree, agree with that. Let's right. stipulate. Right. Exactly. That. Yeah. Here's what I put though. Here's the problem with her question. Let me, because this is why I had to re- rewrite these several times. So just, and I'll, I'll, read, I'll read the way I wrote it so I don't confuse it. And then you can tell right. me if you think this is good. I said, just because someone is quote unquote coerced by circumstances, non physical, but somebody's coerced by circumstances to make hard choices. Does 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 that mean they have no freedom? So in other words, she begs the question by defining freedom as the complete absence of negative external forces that influence choice. Okay, right. So is there any such possibility in life to be quote unquote free from external compulsion? So that's what she did. She basically, I think, begs the question by saying, "Oh well, you know, if you're going to define it as just physical, there's all kinds of forces that force you know that this." free markets denied. Sure. But you can have any system of government. It cannot possibly eliminate external forces that compel us, that, that shape our choices, that make us make hard decisions or make us uncomfortable. So she set it up as if that's a failure. But the point is, her question it gives an answer of no to both systems right. because all systems have external coercive forces I, that limit freedom, right? But let me add this. You're right. And let me add this on the Rawlsian view. The Rawlsian view seems to not... Uh, it, the Rawlsian view doesn't militate against force. Which yeah. is a problem that comes it up in our later question. Ex- exactly. exactly. The Rawlsian view does not militate against force. It only wants to guarantee that everybody is equal at the very beginning. And how do you get people in a free society to give up any of their differences? So, for example, I'm handsome, and Ward... Mm. 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 Which is why, on the cartoon, guys, I, I elevated his handsome well, yeah, yeah, yeah. and brought you down. So, I was trying so, to equalize so, him. So, he's so, 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 about so, cartoon so, 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 I tried to equalize So, how do we, how do we uh, equalize that? Well, it's equal because... Distributive justice. Distributive justice. <laughs> in, the car, in the cartoon, you, that's why I distribute... Uh, so, how do, we, how do you equalize that? You mm. punch Ward in the face, make him a little bit... Uh, oh, you know what I mean? You punch me in the face. face, make you a little bit uglier. Right. So, match Ward. But you see what I'm saying, though? Her, her view doesn't militate against that. <laughs> it doesn't. It, it's, it's, Duck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, oh, all right. Yes. So, so, yeah, um... 
So it seems like part of what she's saying is like pe- people should not be, I want to say, coerced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or to do things, but that's just not the case. That's I not mean, reality. Yeah. That's not. That's not real. I, I have. I have. Well, she sounds like it's possible not to be like that. Only Nozickian has any coercion. That's terrible. You know, right, right. you can't possibly. And what she assumes it. falsely is this: that if, if there are not prop, now I don't want to coerce people uh, in a wrong way, but coercion is can be and it should be. Some coercion well, is good. Is the right thing to do. Peer pressure and well, because peer people. Pressure. Here's one thing she's not dealing with: is the fact that people are evil, mm-hmm. the sinful side, mm-hmm. the ethical side of people. Some mm-hmm. people are just rotten, or they have problems with being as good as they should be. I have several different articles here. Here's one up in up in uh, this is about uh, the San Francisco has become a slum by by the bay because of bad laws mm-hmm. laws that allow people to defecate in the yards of other people to yeah. shoot up right in front of them but they'll 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 get a person who's uh, drinking a beer but the per- people that are doing uh, doing shooting up and said it's nasty to see people shoot up right in front of you please don't do anything about it. Uh, very rarely are they arrested for vagrancy. Ag- aggressive panhandling are going to the bathroom in people's lawns. There were 60,000 complaints to police. 125 people were arrested. Wow. You know, and this is just, and it's, it's just the laws that allow this to happen. It's yeah. like, oh, well, you know, some, some coercion, you know, is, is needed. It's not just all freedom. Um, but if yeah. you allow people, if you put them all equal and they give them seventy dollars a month, they, they give yes. them, they're giving them all they're this, giving they're giving them all this shelter, money, yeah. they're giving food stamps, they're giving train tickets, and they're giving seventy dollars a month a month cash. That doesn't solve the problems because the problem is not always what they have, but who they are. Yeah, there's sometimes it, it's, now, and she would say, "Oh, well, that's because you're an oppressive white guy that you want to say." I'm, you know, being serious. You know, right, like, right, oh, yeah. you want to oppress people, you don't deny that. Right. Oh, you want the genetic? Yeah. I see that. It does, I yeah. see that this model does not work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And this model did not bring work, people out of power. Her, her, her model works everywhere except in reality. Exactly. So, so that leads us into question two, which is that's a good example here. Here's question two. She says, "Is any free?" Uh, this is Dr. Amira, uh, her question number two. Is any free, not physically compelled, exchange morally permissible? If you say yes, then you think that any exchange can't be exploitative and thus immoral. That's where I like she does the double negatives that are really mm. confusing there. Right. Which, so what she's saying is that, um, here's my restatement of her point. She argues that any non-physical compelled exchange is immoral. That's what she's arguing. Any non, any non-physical compelled exchange is immoral, because she's saying that that's what knows knows on, on his account. On his account, right. Any but non- if right. you agree with her, then you are you arguing anyone compelled by an external force, such as government forcing people to pay taxes mm-hmm. under threat of jail, mm-hmm. uh, impinges upon freedom and is therefore immoral. She only applies the question one way. One way. Right. That's exactly. that's the problem with her question, and mm-hmm. I think. Honestly, that's why she writes it so confusedly, because if you look at the double negatives and stuff, right, I right. don't think she understands that. I think if you look at the poor phrasing, I think it's part of her confused right. thinking, to be honest. I don't think she was confused writing it on purpose. I think she just doesn't get it. That if you actually think about that question and ask it of both Rawls and Nozick, you know, does this non, do, do both have non-physical compulsion? Yes. Well, she says that makes Nozick's view wrong. Well, therefore, it also must make, make Rawls' view oh, wrong, wrong if right. that question is the same for both. But she doesn't want it to be a, for both. I have an example. I, when oh, I read the two examples. I have, look at this example today. Look, look, look at what happens when you have no, no compulsion. Now, these next two, and I'll, I'll bring up the other one in a little bit, I think we already talked about, but they're really good examples. <clears throat> Let's take away compulsion, right? Yeah. All compulsion. <clears throat> this pertains to the officers, uh, the, the massacre, the Parkland massacre, where students were shot. 17 were killed, the staff and students were killed, 70 others injured. The shooters on campus, the police show up, mm-hmm. they hear the shooting going on, and they do not go in and engage the shooter. The judge ruled on their behalf. They do not have an obligation. The police... Uh, do not uh, have an obligation, a legal obligation to protect citizens who are not in their custody. Mm. So now, shooters on campus actively shooting and killing people. 
The police cannot be compelled. They have no obligation to go in and stop them. As a parent, you show up. You know your kids are in there. They could be shot. If you try and get in, who are they, what will the police do? Mm. They'll stop yeah. you, won't they? Yeah. yeah. So now they'll stop you. Police aren't an obligation to protect them, but they will stop you. The only person in control of that campus is the shooter and the lives of those children, and there's no one there now to stop them. And this... Yeah. And I think it all depends to question four, by the way, too. I have mean, similar stories under question four, okay. but I'm just yeah. tying yeah. it in right. as well. Yeah. I think there's yeah. some crossover so to that as well. There, there are, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a good point. I think it's valid here, and I'm just saying it'll come back in. Right. The, the, we're going to come back to that, I think, in question yeah. four. Yeah, so anyway, it, it's, a, it's yeah. a real problem. Compuls there are times where compulsion is necessary, and if that's the case, then her view is wrong. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you hold so, both views right? to account, right. she's, that's why her argument is so poor. It's because she's just saying, just "I'm horrible. applying these questions to one view. Therefore, by default, the other my view, view there, must there's be right." No, there's no, no but scrutiny. She does not, there's no fair scrutiny at all. She does not, yeah. with intellectual rigor, apply those same questions to both views, and therefore disqualify both. That's a good question. Oh, we got another question here. Let's see here. All right. Go ahead and read that for us. Wouldn't it, wouldn't redistribution of wealth be external compulsion? Y yes, exactly, and that's mm -hmm. that was that's right. what I said. You know, if you're if the government is saying I'm taxing you, but it's the right type. Uh, exactly, but it's still external compulsion that impinges on freedom, which she says is what taxes. disqualifies Nozick's view from being valid, but right. not her view from being valid. So right. yes, I, that's that's part of the problem in her argument. Why it's so? I think actually. Hers is of the ones we've covered so far, one of the weakest. But, um, you know, but yeah, but yeah, that's exactly it. So let's look at question three. Yeah. Unless you want to say, I'm this is one of the dumber ones. But go ahead. No. Okay. Yeah, so on, on anything on two, or you want? You no, want no, no. Go ahead. Okay. So question three: Do people? Here's her question. Those are Mira's question. Do people deserve all that they are able, and only what they are able to get through free exchange? If you say yes, you think that what people deserve is largely a matter of luck. And by luck, she means you, uh, you were born with the right you know, family, and the, and the culture at the moment uh, favors whatever you're good at. You know. Which I don't know anyone who, I mean, maybe this guy did do that. I have no idea that anyone who says that. What? Yeah. If somebody I mean, argued that, he's, well, he's dumb. They're, they're, That's a terrible exactly. argument. But, 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 so I would agree with her. Look, look, look at Zuckerberg, let me, right? Yeah, but see, he could not Bill have been. Gates. He, Zuckerberg and Bill Gates could not have become tech millionaires. if it, Most of your tech millionaire CEOs were born between 1945 and 1955. Most of your railroad barons were born, you know, 50 years before the railroad industry boomed. You right. can't you you cannot account for the industry that will be here when you are born. But depending on the time in history that you're born, it's is lucky. I don't want to say lucky, but it's providential. That's her world. Her, her world. world. It's providential. Well, you know, but it doesn't. Advantage of but you have to be able it. to take advantage of it because right. not everybody born in 1945 to 55 became right. A tech CEO or, or oil or oil, oil baron. Right. Exactly. Or or is or is born. Yeah. This is where this is where it's important we understand it. She believes that only as a naturalist, you know, atheist coming from this, there's no natural law theory, there's no God to govern these things. Mm -hmm. Only government can institute the moral good. Mm -hmm. So if government doesn't do it, it will not it will not and cannot happen. So her choices have to be which system of government will, it, of government right. will it, you know, make the most moral good, very utilitarian sort of mm -hmm. approach. So she, again, doesn't see that there's alternatives where government has a limited role and people are compelled by faith in a God who says, hey, I'm going to serve sure. out, of my, out of what I have. Hey, maybe what I have is I'm blessed with. I'm lucky to have. Right. So I give and I help others because God compels me to help others. She doesn't recognize that as a valid option because it's not within her worldview. What's really interesting which is, is why, again, that her someone asked fails. the question, why are almost all hockey players built, born between August, I mean, August and October? Why are almost all professional hockey players born between August and October? Is that true? It's true. Ninety-five percent of your hockey players are born between August and October mm -hmm. in the NHL. It's the off season. No, because the date, the date for making it in, because there's a cutoff date in order to for play join, for join join leagues, is is arbitrary, and it favors those kids who are born in those months. Uh, okay. So and so, what ends up happening is those kids who are born in those months 
ultimately play hockey a year older uh, okay. than their peers. So their their peers are they're a year older physically, although they haven't reached the cutoff date. Oh, I see. What you're saying. Than, yeah. than their peers are. So so ultimately, when they get on the on the on the uh, the ice against their peers, they're more coordinated. They're bigger, and what means that what that means is because they're more coordinated, they're bigger, they're better, and because they're more coordinated, bigger, and better, they get put, they get selected for more hockey all star yeah. games. You see what I'm saying? So it artificially favors those people who are born before the cutoff date. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. But it's but it's true. Hmm. That was in the book um, Outliers. So that's their point. It's just love. It's just for for but for them, it's arbitrary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but then change the date. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. just. It's just she's she's in the left field. She just doesn't understand how this all works. Yeah. Well, that's what I... So, again, because she states things as a negative, I think it confuses yeah. her point. Mm-hmm. So here's my restating her, my restatement of her point. So to state her point, what she's arguing for in a positive way, not what she's arguing against, but here's what she's arguing for. People do not deserve to keep what they earn or mm-hmm. produce because what they have is just the luck of birth and cultural values at the time. That's what she's arguing for. Right. But here's my sort of rejoinder. Let's apply it to everything. But if someone is, quote unquote, lucky enough to live in a time when the culture says we should redistribute wealth, then why should they get that money? Mm-hmm. I mean, if they were just lucky to be born poor and lucky the government values their lack of earnings potential, why should they get the money? <laughs> they were just lucky. Right. They were just lucky to be right. born poor, lucky that they didn't have to work to earn it. And right. why should they get anything? I mean, so... Again, she, if you look at the same standard she has that she's applying to that and try to apply it equally to her view, it fails. 100%. So, Absolutely. again, I don't have to know whether she's fair in describing Rawls and Nozick. Right. I'm just taking everything she has at face value. Just what she's saying about her, uh, her, and her own. argument. Yeah. Her argument within itself fails mm-hmm. on the, on, right. to, to meet its own standard. She just has a preference. And that's the point. There's no real. She wants to. She wants to flatten society. But the thing that that really struck me with this part, with this question, is, she's going to have to harm more people in order to flatten society. She's going to have to make the talented people less talented. She's going to have to make the people who are born or make them use their talents to benefit others. Right. By and, forced and labor. That's, and that's Harrison Burgeon. Huh. I wonder yeah. what it is when people have forced labor, it forced like, to do work <laughs> for less pay or no pay. <laughs> Sounds like that communism. sounds familiar. I know. Social, socialism. No, I can't think of a system. Now, can you ever think of a time in U.S. history where people were forced to work and not paid? No. Oh, my no, gosh. That's never that's happened. That's never happened in America. That's never happened. Never happened. Yeah, she's clearly got a new system here. Slavery. No ever, I wasn't going to say it, but... Slavery. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is, she has, in order for this system oh, that she right. wants to erect to work, she has to take from the, from the, from the few... The, or the many to give yeah. them a few. And she's got to flatten out everything. And that doesn't work. You, you have to do tremendous harm to people in order for that to work. It's definitely, yeah. It just yeah. doesn't well, it, work. It, it, it's predicated on the view that uh, having someone having more wealth than someone else is wrong. But there's no basis for that whatsoever. Even on her, even on a naturalistic viewpoint, there's no, there's no basis for that. You know, yeah. how, is it, how is it morally wrong? Um, and how is inheritance wrong? Well, then, there's, there's no... She doesn't justify this at all. Mm-hmm. See, uh-huh. it, yeah, exactly. So. Well, and that's again where her think of her question: Do these people deserve all that they have? Deserve all they have, and only what they're able to get through free exchange? I don't think she deserves credit for this. There's an alternative. That. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's an alternative though. It's that the people that have earned it, they yeah, they legally should be able. To, they shouldn't be compelled by the force of government and force mm-hmm. to give up what they have earned. But I, I as a Christian, believe that they should be compelled by a God who created to value the sacredness of all those who do not have right. and out of the abundance of, of their, their hearts, right. share what they have earned but you freely see, with others. And those Christians typically are the ones that do that with many Christian um, charities. Uh, charities helping out people by far. But see, more. But see you, yes. what, exactly. what, you just, what you just highlighted was the fact that was something that she does not believe in. She doesn't believe that there is a God Exactly why she only has these two choices. Which is why she wants, implicitly in her argument, she wants to compel people to to give. She wants, and this is an argument that we've been having, you know, in our country. Because she doesn't think they're going to do it out of the goodness of her heart. She's going to do it out of the goodness of her heart or the people on the government and take it from you regardless. She she said she's put herself in a position of being the art. And this is the thing about Rawlsian um, theory is that Rawls puts himself out on the outside and he. 
makes an arbitrary system. He looks at the, the way he wants things and he's going to shape things all the way back in order to get that. So Rawls chooses what the system is going to be ahead of time and then forces everybody into that direction. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what she's doing. Okay, so we, we have another question here um, from Brent's online. He says, if she comes from an atheistic, naturalistic position, how does she justify taking care of the weak and poor? Well, why would the atheist take care of the weak and poor? Why would the naturalist? Why not for survival of the fittest? Nature is red in tooth and claw. Why shouldn't the weak die? Why shouldn't the, the strong live? Why shouldn't the strong and the dominant rule? I mean, she has to answer those questions. Yeah. She doesn't have an answer for those questions. That's actually the result of her system, yeah. is to, t- to take from the many. And it, the it, many. All, it all assumes a, an objective morality. Right. Yeah. And she there's, borrows, no ground, there's, yeah. there's no grounding for an She's objective morality She's borrowing from the Christian worldview. Right. Why should we listen to her? Why should anyone listen to her? What's the moral yeah. obligation to listen to her? Yeah. You have your so what? So the, yeah, she's she's assuming there's a, a moral imperative to do that that just everybody must agree to, mm-hmm. which borrows only from the Christian worldview, not from a naturalistic worldview, mm-hmm. right. and that's exactly part of the problem that's you know inherent and, and you know, as throughout the whole thing. You know, we do hold yeah. to the values you mentioned of, of people, but we also hold to the value of work. Right and, uh, of of work honoring the Lord work for people work worth their wages work, working work yeah. worthy of their wages and also being able to uh, help other people and doing good on our own uh, without being compelled to do it because the issue is not um, um, these people are are poor always um, the issue is some many times even like in the uh, uh, the article I read there about up in San Francisco. Do you need more services? And they said that the guy went out and talked to these people, the homeless people. So we don't want more services. We don't. We don't care. We don't. We don't want to get off the street. We have. We have it nice. We, we don't want to go get jobs. We have what we need here. So it actually takes away the incentive to work and contribute to society. Mm-hmm. It's counterproductive, and mm-hmm. that's a moral wrong, I think. And we can justify that through Christian faith. Let's get so. to point four because we're we're. I don't want to go yeah. too far over time. Um, uh, as we draw towards our close, that was a good article for number four. I, I have I have a couple things to mention too, but this, I'll okay. make sure I get those later. I'll post all those as well okay. on, the, on the blog after. Okay. Her, she, Dr. Amira says this. This is one of these questions that is so difficult to understand. Oh my gosh, I read this mm-hmm. seventy five thousand times. Are people under no obligation to do anything they don't freely want to do or freely commit themselves to doing? <laughs> oh, that's such a poorly written. I mean. Oh, I would give a student a bad grade if I wrote that. She says, if you say yes, then you think the only moral requirements are the ones we freely bring on ourselves, say, by making promises or contracts. So restating her point, for those who don't understand poor grammar, uh, restating her point, people, she believes people should be forced by government to do things they do not want to do because they are lucky enough to have resources that others need. That's my positive statement Mm -hmm. of what she's arguing Mm -hmm. for. Again, denying that there's a third option through any kind of belief in a God who constrains us as believers to help and serve and sacrifice ourselves. She's like, hey, if you don't believe, if you believe, you know, the only way to do it is if you, by committing to it and not being forced, you're evil. Right. Well, I'm, I'm understanding what kind of obligation she means here. Is it moral? Is it legal? Is it relational? Where does, upon what, where does this obligation come from? What does she mean by obligation? I think, that's, I think she uses them all synonymously, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it's, just, it's just much. She it's mental much. The, moral is the same as legal. Whatever the law is is what is moral. What is moral. But, no, but that's not the case. Unless it disagrees with what she uh, already exactly. says. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely not the case because she has something else in mind and the law doesn't matter. If it was... If it, if the law is the morality, you can't disagree with the law, no matter how much you know. You, no yeah. changing it. So, there, so she she's equivocating on terms and has not thought through this very well at all. No, so, it, it and is. And, to, and the problem is not. It's partly the law, but once again, it comes back to people and and who they are. And I, I don't think she accounts for human nature on this. Yeah. And and here here's the oh sorry here's the, the article I have on that. Well, while you look it up, it is ironic though. She, her, her assumption is human nature, people are greedy, but human nature is everybody's good, and that they want to, you well, know, they're, they're not wrong or but bad. But those poor people, it's, it's too bad. But they're not. Yeah, they're. I, it's it's totally I messed don't, up. I don't. Yeah, there's. Where, whereas, and we, I brought this article up a, a one of sessions ago, but it applies. 
a, a group of Florida teens who taunted a drowning man. Oh, I had the same one. <laughs> Let me read your illustration before you do that article. Okay, okay. Because here's her illustration. <laughs> I thought of this exact same oh, one. I already yeah. have this link. There it so is. Good, I was reading. It says, See, okay. good minds think alike, but you'll be there. Oh. I already thought of it. I just didn't want to use it as a... Uh... Here's her illustration of question number four. Suppose I'm walking to the library and see a man drowning in the river. Right. I decide that the pleasure I would get from saving his life wouldn't exceed the cost of getting wet right. and the delay. Right. So I walk on by. Since I make no contract with the man, I am under no obligation to save him. There's two. There's several points that illustrate this. First, she assumes that the only reason to do it is utilitarian. My pleasure versus my inconvenience. Mm -hmm. So it's purely individualistic, utilitarian, you know, thought that drives people. And she also assumes social contract theory. Since I've made no contract with him, right. which social contract theory is the, the rejection of natural law, the rejection of a, of a Christian worldview. That's the only reason we have social mm -hmm. contract theory. So she's assumed utilitarianism and social contract theory in the framing of her question and a gross ignorance of actually what the law states in the United States, even though she's talking about the United States. So she's put in all those assumptions right. into one very poorly given illustration. It's a, it's a loaded, you know, loaded question to force you into a position you don't necessarily hold to refute a straw man argument and therefore justify oh, by default her so position. Horrible. That she would fail any of my classes on logic. So. Oh, this, anyway, this is why I think she's the worst of all of them so far, because I think she's... She stepped in it so terribly. Anyway, the, it, so your story to illustrate yeah, so here, what yeah. she doesn't understand about now, the U.S. law. So here we have Florida teens. Um, they, they taunted a man while he drowned and filmed his death, and they will not be criminally charged. Uh, because there's no law, there's, yeah. there's no law saying that they have to help that guy. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean what they did was good. In fact, and in fact, they showed no remorse for it, too, even later. Um, the victim was struggling for 10 minutes before he died, and they, and they filmed it. Well, the, this, is, this shows that the human nature can be very wicked, very sinful, mm -hmm. and that they are morally reprehensible. These are horrible human beings, and I hope every single future employer that these guys could possibly have knows who they are and what they're involved in. But, um, you know, so there can be repercussions, but there's, there's no, there's no but law See, that's that. the thing. is She's using one moral argument, right. mm -hmm. which she thinks that people will viscerally respond to, which we did with the story. Emotionally right. respond. Who would not save that person? That's evil not to save the person. But they But won't. she's using that and then applying to her moral case of who would not want to take away somebody else's thousands to give somebody who had no. You're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You are denying mm -hmm. But she believes that both have to be compelled. She she's assuming in that argument though that that helping those people is already compelled by law when it's mm -hmm. not. It's not. We no. don't even compel people no. to save a drowning person by mm -hmm. law. No, but we, we are one of the few nations that have the uh, Good Samaritan law. Ah, well, that's, I have an article about that. Okay, there we go. All right. So there we go, man. Yeah. But people <sighs> misunderstand the Good Samaritan law. This is according to. This. So I actually wanted. To, I thought this is the, this is what I thought of when I saw. I found an article that talked about it. Le legislating morality, Good Samaritan, and the duty to rescue laws. The last episode of Seinfeld. I don't mm. know if you guys remember oh, this. Yes. The <laughs> last episode of Seinfeld. In they jail. were in a small town. For being, uh, they, no, yeah, they were in jail for being. Uh, they didn't help and somebody. Bivalent, uh, and yeah, or there something was somebody, like that. somebody who was something bad happened right. to him, and they watched it. They didn't help them. Right. So they right. went to jail under supposedly Good Samaritan laws, where they were required to help them, and they didn't. Oh, okay. But this article is about essentially that the show itself misunderstands. Samaritan and actually, right. it's That's... possible the liberal writers didn't understand Good Samaritan laws, or they right. were just having a joke. I don't know. Mm -hmm. right. You know, but Science found, I don't know if Seinfeld knew it or just thought it'd be funny. Yeah. But she actually, Dr. Amir, actually does not understand Good Samaritan laws because there are no laws that mandate it. The Good Samaritan laws are there to say if you do help somebody and accidentally cause damage, you you're not going to be you're sued or held liable right. exactly. for helping by exactly. hurting right. and causing harm when you meant to cause good. Especially when you have to give it's a tricky It's not to atomy. compel you to help somebody. If somebody's you know drowning, you are not compelled by law to save them. Right. But if you do try and save now, them. Now, unless you're a doctor. There are laws for doctors. Well, if doctors you're a medical nurses. doctor right. or a nurse right. and you see somebody choking, you are under the Hippocratic Oath because you have a, you've essentially contracted. Right. Which is, you know, a thing to help them, but that's not for everybody. Right. And so she's about as smart as an episode of Seinfeld when it comes mm. to understanding what that law means. So. And and uh, other countries that don't have a good Samaritan law, what happens in there is if some if people see someone who's been shot or hurt, they won't go help them 
because oftentimes the last person to help them, if they die, you're held accountable, even if you didn't shoot them, stab them, hit them yeah. in the car or whatever. So they're like, no, we're not, because I could get sued, I could be held accountable, I could go to prison because of that. Our law is designed, uh, the Good Samaritan law is designed to make sure that that doesn't happen. If right. you, in good conscience, try to help that person and cause more damage or that person dies or whatever, um, you're not held accountable because of that. So, uh, not held accountable. So, anyway, far superior uh, moral underpinning yeah. there. Yeah. So, her, anyway. her, her, her arguments are just vapid. I, I hate to say God. it that way. They're just, they're just bad. I mean, and they don't, they don't understand our system of government. They don't even understand reality, and they're all aimed at flattening out everyone. They're, 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 and they're, it's inequality to take a Michael Jordan and make him a Leroy Hill on the basketball court. It's unfair to Michael Jordan. It's fair to Leroy. It was absolutely unfair to Michael Jordan. It's unfair to make Ward me. It's unfair for me, and it's unfair for Ward, because Ward can never be. Yeah. My, yeah. my son, my oldest son, he, he lost the genetic lottery in hikes exactly. and loved to play basketball. But he would love to be Ward. All those things. And why should he not get the scholarships right. for basketball? Just because he's not as, like, 6'4", right. whatever, you know. It's like, just because he lost discrimination. the That's discrimination. But, but what she wants to do yeah. is, is almost just... perverse, because she wants to remake society into something... Else, society that she's benefited from. She's an intelligent woman. She is a professor. Arguably, at, at, she's a professor at, at Oxford. Mean. She she had great education. <laughs> she had a great education at Princeton and at Princeton and all. She's a, yep. Other yep. people didn't benefit right. from those, from those schools. Did she distribute her grades? Right, exactly. You know, there's there's a Grade study. distribution. Yeah. Did you see the study where they where the professor said, "I'm going to give you know, no matter how hard you study." He was trying to teach his class a lesson. No matter how hard you study, I'm going to grade on the curve. Well, the first time they went out, everybody got at least a B. Well, guess what happened the next time they did the test? Yeah, they went to grade B minus. Curve. No. C plus. The, the smart people didn't do any work. Right, right. So everybody got lower. Lower. Right, yeah. So the, so the point is, it, it just doesn't work. Right, exactly. You take the incentive away for doing work. Right. Yeah. And so that, then no one does. And an incentive, incentive brings... Maybe that's how she passed. Yeah. So, no. Oh. I'm just wondering. I just... just Incentive breeds. I, you know, incentive I, breeds. I'm just kind of we been, We've been sort of nice. To every, I mean, I, I, we try to be fair with everyone, and I have to be fair on this one. I just think the writing is just some of the poorest we've encountered in this well, the, book. The, 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 the logic the double is the poorest. Yes, the, the double logic negatives she writes with that, obs, that obfuscate the meaning of her questions. Uh, the logic itself, when we go beyond the writing to the logic itself, is the most patently... Flawed. Right. Um, it, it's. It's. I just. It's hard for me to take this chapter. Um, here's where she concludes, and we get a final thought from every uh, from anybody. She says, "Thus, Nozick's view uh, must be wrong, because you can't say yes to all four. Mm-hmm. Justice is not simply the unfettered exercise of the free market. I agree. Unfettered access to the free market is not justice, nor mm-hmm. is it moral. She's absolutely right about that." Mm-hmm. Whether, however, she's even if you give the most generous view of free market societies, and and you know even if you say we're all a uh, what a, um, we're a free market economy in the United States, and all the good is done, it doesn't mean it's moral. It just is. I agree with her on that. Um, free market quote unquote morality isn't anything of the sort. Rejecting the Nozickian worldview requires us to reflect on what justice really demands. But here's my th- here's my final thought, and then you guys can get yours. If justice is just another social construct, I mean, mm-hmm. justice is just, because she says in here, justice and morality, you know, it's just so happen, whatever people value at the time, you know, it's whatever people, that's why people succeed, because they genetic lottery, and they're lucky that their talents match with society values. Same with morals or anything else. It's all just a social construct. How can it, de- how can it demand anything? How can, how can a social construct demand anything justice cannot be any more moral than injustice wealth cannot be any more moral than poverty they all are the same because there is no standard to do that Mm -hmm. she has not presented one she just said here's a flaw in this point therefore you must accept my point which is the worst kind of argument Mm -hmm. i mean if a student actually turned in this paper it would be a 
failing grade. It, it would be. It really would be, and it, because it's that poorly Simply done. Simply because she so, didn't consider. Yeah. But it is written well. I mean, for the she moment. didn't. Con- she didn't <laughs> consider. <laughs> well, I mean, there's no well, typos. Well, yeah. well, that's right. I mean, I wasn't. I was like I said. It wasn't the logic of it, but uh, she was. Uh, she didn't know. consider the other side. She didn't give us. She she was very vague on on Rawlsian theory, and and it may be the case that no matter how bad, no Nozickian you know theory is, it's better than Wall than Rawlsian. You know what I mean? But she never really told us what Rawls Rawls's theory was. It's just that when I went to read on it, it's is horrible. Um, it it is all designed to flatten society. It is to take away um, any kind of inequalities, yeah. any differences between us. God enshrines inequality. I'm sorry, he gives some ten. Some five and some thirty. God, God is God is in the inequality. I mean, he, he just does. He doesn't give everybody the same gift. He absolutely does not. It's based on mere existence. It, it's not based on yeah. Uh, on uh, it's his, effort. His own word. his own determination. Right. So exactly. I mean, so on her view, God is immoral. I mean, so oh, because yeah. he but but he does. I mean, so it's a good point. It's it's a confusion between yeah. inequality and uh, inherent sacredness of word. Right. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Like you said, we're all differently talented, we'll different gifted, gifts. and there we'll are genetics. Gifts. Sure, I mean, yeah. some people get genetics. LeBron got genetics. He, he my got kid it. Does not get. Did not get exactly. He won the genetic lottery when it came to that. Sure. But you know what's? But, but, but you so know what? That doesn't mean it's unfair that he has right. what he has. Exactly. But you know what's amazing? But LeBron though? also gives back and helps people, mm-hmm. and has done a lot with his sure. wealth to help a lot of people. And I wouldn't want him to be compelled to do that by the the government. I would yeah. like him to have but, the freedom to help. Him. Those people, of whatever what he's good, been given. and the good that he's been doing, so, we don't really, we wouldn't see it as good if he was compelled to do it. We yeah. wouldn't recognize it as good. Right. In the same way, your son may not have gotten LeBron's height and basketball ability, but God may have given him something else. We just don't know what that he, is. Yet. Exactly. You know what I mean? And whatever exactly. God gave Maybe your son, twenty or thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> no, whenever, no. whenever God gave totally your son, fake. you know, and in the long run, when that gift explains shows, it'll explain his existence. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. This is a, this, Better, is a, this say. type of thinking is is used to justify a lot of whining. Yeah, yeah. It's what I think is what's done. It's like people have a lot more. How can we whine our way into taking from them and giving to others? And here it is. Yeah. But that's unjust. And, and I think the troublesome part you brought back at the very beginning we never really got back to because we ran out of time. But the troublesome part is that she says you know uh, non whites and women and gays all stuff are these oppressive. She implies that they are genetically inferior, incapable mm-hmm. of succeeding on their own. Mm-hmm. Right. She implies it there. She that does. That's they lost the genetic lottery by right. being those things. That is appalling. Mm-hmm. I mean, to 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 say that somebody who is poor uh, is just you know looking at a, a black person who is poor. Well, you just lost the genetic because you're inferior. Therefore, I need. To, I'm going to be the bigger person because I won the genetic lottery because I'm white or I'm was whatever I am therefore I'm going to help you mm-hmm. the assumption that somebody is inferior because of their skin color right. or their economic condition I find appalling and reprehensible right and she does she won't even admit that that's what she says but that's that's what the, the argument that's the implication. is she would make it she would make the argument that I, I it, yeah, she would say that just, the west is just unjust and we would need we need to rethink what we mean by justice in the West. That's yeah. what she would say. Yeah. yeah. And be, There's and nothing that's done more and more more good and more better, um, done better for societies right. than capitalistic, uh, free market well, type thing. Then, so. Chris, no, I would, I would with, qualify with, that. With Judeo-Christian values. With Judeo-Christian values yes. coupled with some that, form of free market good. society. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good because enough. I agree with her to this. Free markets Alone. are not a moral justice Mm-mm. on their own. Neither is the liberalism. On its own, from a naturalistic worldview, both result in oppression, <clears throat> and both can. Mm-hmm. But if you couple Christianity right. with, right. I think free markets, you get. It. I don't think you can couple it with the, you know, the essentially socialistic Marxist. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly not common because so. the Christian view is, you know, the Christian says, "What's mine is yours." What the socialist Marxist says is, "What yours is mine." Mm-hmm. It's a very different thing. Mm-hmm. In terms of that money, it may look like the same. Hey, we're exchanging money, but there's a very different oppressive view from the latter that's forcing people by threat of violence mm-hmm. or jail that they must give what they've earned, and that is not good. And she doesn't face that truth in her yeah. in her in her article. So, mm-hmm. yeah. all right, last. Well, let's go let, real quick. So next week, uh, assuming we don't run into troubles again, we missed a couple weeks here, but. 
Uh, the, it's the section on citizenship. Citizenship. Argument number 42. Mm-hmm. The morality of migration. Oh, this should be timely. <laughs> I mean, this was written several years ago, but migration. It's talking about building the wall, and oh my goodness, if that doesn't have relevance to this one. By uh, Sila Ben Habib. Ben Habib. Sila Ben Habib. At least I can Sila. say that one a little bit easier. Uh, ben Habib. So we're going to discuss that, uh, the morality of migration, in our next show. show. So hopefully, it will be next Thursday, because I've got an obligation through Wednesday for a little bit here. So we're going to be Thursdays for a little bit, at least through the end of March. But hopefully, we'll be next Thursday at 2, 2 p.m. All right.